All right, so we'll get started here. And as I said, I'll be letting people in as we go. Um, so I just mentioned, if you didn't hear, feel free to turn your mic on and ask a question at any time. I want you guys to get the most out of this as possible. So, you know, go ahead and just chime in whenever you like. I'll be taking questions at the end as well. So you can wait till the end if you like, or if you want to just send me an email, you can do that as well. So my email is thomasjmalchow at gmail.com. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Thomas Malchow. I am a registered kinesiologist and exercise physiologist with the American College of Sports Medicine and a strength and conditioning specialist with the uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association. All right, so we'll start with what might seem like a silly question, but how do we define aging? All right, it seems like a silly question, but we actually can't agree on a singular definition of aging because people don't all age the same way, right? For a lot of people, as they get older, they gradually lose the ability to participate in activities that used to be easy, right? So for example, maybe their favorite sport. And that's pretty common, but it doesn't happen to everybody. And I think we all know people who are getting older, but they're still living very active and, and very energetic lives. I have a friend who is 77 years old and he plays hockey three times a week and skis every weekend during the winter. And in the summer, he still plays hockey once or twice a week and he cycles pretty much every day. And he has a group of friends, they're all in their seventies and eighties. They ski together and they cycle together. And they go on some pretty impressive bike rides. Like in the summer, it's not unusual for them to cycle from Kitsilano to Steveston, have some fish and chips and then cycle back, right? And that's like a 50 kilometer bike ride. And again, they're all in their seventies and eighties. And so if you compare that group of friends who are 70 and 80 years old, with other people who are 70 and 80 years old, you can see that there can be a pretty big difference in how people age. And so that begs the question, why do people age differently? Well, aging is the result of a combination of lifestyle factors, environmental factors, and genetics. Now, of these three factors, which one do you think has the biggest impact or plays the biggest role in how we age? It's lifestyle factors. Lifestyle factors by far have the biggest impact on how we age. A lot of people think it's genetics, right? And quite often when we see people who look really good for their age, maybe they're very active, they're very strong, we oftentimes think like, man, they must have great genetics. They do have great genetics, but here's the interesting thing that we're now learning about genetics. We can change our genetics. We can modify the expression of our genetic code with our lifestyle choices. Okay, so I'll say, that, I'll say that again in a different way. The lifestyle choices we make modify the expression of our genetic code. Okay, so if we get good sleep quality, if we have good nutrition, if we exercise, and if we make other healthy lifestyle choices, our genes will respond and we can upregulate certain health promoting genes and downregulate other genes that maybe aren't so healthy. One second here. Falling behind on the uh, letting people in, I think. So again, if we make healthy lifestyle choices, we can upregulate healthy genes and downregulate maybe genes that aren't so healthy. And the reverse is also true, right? If we make unhealthy lifestyle choices, we can upregulate genes that aren't so healthy and downregulate health promoting genes. So one way we can think about this is. Our genes determine what might be, but our lifestyle choices determine what we actually become, right? Again, our lifestyle choices modify the expression of our genetic code. And so what that means is you have a lot of control over how you age. And that's the big message that I wanna get across to you guys today. You have a lot of control over how you age and it's never too late to start. And so, what we'll do now is I'm gonna take you through the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, and the cardiorespiratory system. And I'll show you some of the changes that occur to these systems as we get older, if we don't exercise and if we don't make healthy lifestyle choices. Okay, so that's gonna be some bad news, right? 
Then I'll show you some good news. I'll show you how exercise and physical fitness can counteract and sometimes even reverse some of those negative age-related changes. One second here, just letting people in. So we'll start with the nervous system and we'll begin with structural and physiological changes first. And again, guys, jump in anytime. If you wanna ask a question, just turn your mic on and ask the question. Don't feel like you, you have to wait till the end. So as we get older, MRI studies have shown that there's a 10 to 15% decrease in brain matter, okay? So our brain gets a little bit smaller. We also lose neurons. So the neuron is a nerve cell. It's responsible for carrying information throughout the body and throughout the brain. We also have a thinning of dendrites. The dendrite is where a neuron receives information from other cells, okay? So we have fewer neurons and fewer connections between neurons. So that means communication signals travel at a slower rate. Now, communication signals don't just travel by neuron, they also travel by chemical messenger. And we call these chemical messengers neurotransmitters. As we get older, our sensitivity to these neurotransmitters diminishes. Okay, so that also slows down communication signals. Oh, somebody's, somebody's mic's on. There we go. So that also slows down communication signals in the body, okay? Now these structural and physiological changes are going to lead to functional changes. Our response speed becomes slower. We process information slower. Our short-term memory stays about the same, but our long-term memory diminishes and it becomes more difficult to learn new motor skills. And again, this is if we don't exercise and make healthy lifestyle choices, okay? What happens if we exercise? Well, first of all, our brain gets bigger. MRI studies have shown that there's an increase in brain volume with exercise. We also have an increase in neurons and an increase in dendrite connections between neurons. So remember those changes I showed you first where we have that 10 to 15% decrease in brain matter, a decrease in neurons and a decrease or thinning of dendrites. All of that is counteracted if we exercise, okay? We also have an increase in the number of capillaries in the brain and the amount of blood volume in the brain, and that's also positive. With more neurons and better connections between neurons, we process information faster, which leads to faster reaction times, improved balance and mobility, and better coordination. Our memory also improves and becomes easier to learn new things, okay? so. If we exercise, we can counteract many of the changes that occur in the nervous system as we get older, okay? So that's good news. What about the musculoskeletal system? And again, we'll start with the structural and physiological changes first. So as we get older, we have a decrease in the total number of muscle fibers. So muscle fibers are the muscle cells. It's just in muscle, we don't call them muscle cells. We call them fibers because they actually look like fibers. They're, they're cylinder shaped and they're typically a few centimeters long. So we have a decrease in the total number of muscle fibers. The muscle fibers that remain become smaller. In fact, for sedentary people, peak muscle fiber size occurs around the age of 20 and then it starts to decline, okay? We also have a loss of bone mass. Our joints become stiffer and weaker and our joints also become more unstable. These structural and physiological changes lead to functional changes. The changes in skeletal muscle lead to decrements in strength, power, and endurance. The changes in the joints lead to reduced mobility. In fact, uh, joint range of motion can be reduced by as much as 25% as we get older. And if we have less strength and we have less mobility, then it's gonna be more difficult for us to participate in activities that we enjoy. This also increases the risk for injury. The loss of bone mass can increase the risk for osteoporosis. And of course, that's gonna also increase our risk for injury. And uh, so that's obviously bad news, right? But what happens if we exercise? Well, they've done research with master athletes. So these are people who are in their seventies and they found that muscle mass, strength, power, and endurance are maintained to a greater extent compared to their sedentary counterparts. Right, so as we get older, we're, we're gonna lose some muscle strength. That's inevitable, especially as we move into our 70s. But if we exercise, and in particular, if we strength train, we can maintain more of our strength for longer, okay? 
And if we take a look at the muscle fibers, remember earlier I mentioned that peak muscle fiber size occurs around the age of 20 for sedentary people and it starts to decline. Well, for people who exercise, who are physically active, that doesn't happen until the age of 60. Okay, and then when it does happen, it progresses, it progresses at a much slower rate. So that's a pretty big difference. And that's a big reason why my friend at 77 years old can still ride his bike to Steveston and back because his muscle fibers are still very strong. And it's never too late to start. So a lot of people, they feel like, oh man, I've kind of let my health slide and I've, been, I've waited too long and now I'm old and it's too late. They've done studies with people who have been sedentary their entire life and are now 70 years old. And they found they can still increase their muscle mass, strength, power and endurance, okay? So it's never, it's never too late to start. What about the bones? People who are physically active are able to retain their bone mass. And for people who are currently losing bone mass, studies have shown that we can actually increase bone mass with physical activity, especially if we're doing weight bearing exercises or resistance training. What about the joints? With exercise, our joints become healthier. We can improve range of motion. We can improve joint stability and we can improve proprioception. Okay, and all of this is gonna decrease our risk for injury and improves our functional capacity. So just like with the nervous system, the literature is very clear. If we exercise, we can counteract many of the changes that occur to the musculoskeletal system as we get older. Okay, so that's more good news. Let's take a look at the cardiorespiratory system. So this includes the heart, the blood vessels, and the lungs. And again, we're gonna start with the structural and physiological changes first. So as we get older, there is a, a normal enlargement of the heart, and that's primarily due to an increase in cardiac muscle cells, and that's totally normal. The electrical activity of the heart becomes slower. The arteries become stiffer, which forces the heart to work harder. And there is a loss of elasticity in the lung tissue, okay? These structural and physiological changes are going to lead to functional changes. We experience a decrease in cardiovascular efficiency. Maximum heart rate decreases by 30 to 50% between the ages of 25 and 85. Maximum cardiac output decreases by 30% between the ages of 20 and 80. And as a result, recreational and daily activities can become more challenging, okay? But what happens if we exercise? Well, our resting heart rate decreases and our stroke volume increases. So stroke volume is uh, how much blood the heart pumps out with each beat, right? So if the heart is beating less, but pumping out more blood with each beat, that means we become more efficient, right? We've increased our cardiovascular efficiency. We also increase our maximum cardiac output and that's, that leads to an increase in maximum exertion. So that means we can preserve our cardiorespiratory fitness and increase our functional capacity. It also reduces our risk for heart disease, okay? So just like with the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system, if we exercise, we can counteract many of the negative changes that occur to the cardiorespiratory system as we get older. Sorry, just letting some people in here. So for the people who have just joined, if you, if you wanna ask a question, just feel free to jump in and ask the question. You don't have to wait till the end. I want this to be as interactive as possible. And I want you guys to get the information out of this at, that you're looking for. So just feel free to jump in anytime. All right, so I hope you guys are finding this motivating so far. Uh, the literature is very clear that if we make habitual exercise part of our lifestyle, we can have a significant impact on our health and in doing so counteract many of the negative changes that occur to the body as we get older, okay? So that's good news. And I think we probably all kind of understood that, right? We, we know that exercise is gonna help us um, uh, prolong our longevity and help us live you know, better lives. The hard part is making those lifestyle changes, right? So how do we go about creating lifestyle change? And that's really kind of the magic sauce in all this. What I'm gonna show you now is a five-step process for creating lifestyle change. Step one is we have to clarify what we want. And the, and the literature is very clear about this. 
people who have a clear sense of what they want not only achieve more, but they're also psychologically and physically healthier than people with no direction or, or people with ambiguous or conflicting goals. So you have to clarify what you, what you want. Now, that can be difficult because we don't always understand what we want, right? And so to help us, I have some questions here that we can ask ourselves. These are just sample questions, but I want you to think about this. What do you want your life to be like in four or five years? All right, think about that. What do you want your life to be like in four or five years? What would you try to accomplish if you knew that you couldn't fail? And what is stopping you from pursuing these accomplishments? What kind of activities do you find interesting and engrossing? What activities do you enjoy but no longer participate in? And why are you no longer participating in these activities? What influences your decision to be inactive or active? Okay, so again, these are just some sample questions, but they'll help clarify what your vision is and what your priorities are. Also help you understand what your barriers are. And that's also really important, okay? After clarifying what we want in step one, in step two, we develop a strategy that helps us achieve what we want, right? So we have to turn our ambition into consistent action. And how do we do that? With short-term and long-term goals, okay? We wanna focus on the short-term goals though. Our goals should be specific and they should be challenging but achievable, okay? They should also be time-bound and near-term. So here are some examples. Find a compatible workout partner in the next week. Do 60 minutes of cardiovascular exercise in the next week. Perform 30 consecutive body weight squats by the end of the month. Walk 5,000 steps each day in the next week. Attend a group exercise class every week this month. Okay, so those are just some examples. Step three is belief, right? We have to believe in ourselves. And an important part of believing in yourself is moving towards what's called an internal locus of control. So an internal locus of control means that we believe we have control over what happens. And the best way to achieve an internal locus of control is by increasing our self-efficacy and our self-confidence. And the best way to do that is to think baby steps, okay? If we try to do too much too quickly, we can undermine our self-efficacy and our self-confidence, and it will be harder for us then to see that we're actually in control, right? The best way for us to build confidence is with slow, steady progress, okay? So think baby steps. Step four is persistence. We have to stick with it, and we have to find ways to exercise every day. And that doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym. Um, and even if you do go to the gym, it's still important to find ways to be active outside of traditional exercise, right? So for example, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, walking around the neighborhood, participating in a preferred sport or activity, walking a pet, parking farther away from buildings so you have to walk a little bit further, gardening or doing yard work. All of these are great ways to be active outside of traditional exercise. So you don't have to go to the gym. You just have to find ways to be active. Step five is self-monitoring. Now, a lot of people don't like doing this, but it can be really motivating and, it, and it's a great way to, um, to show your progress, okay? There's a lot of different ways we can do this. There's apps. Pretty much every phone has an app now that counts your steps and all of that. And that's a great way to monitor progress. You can also just keep a diary, right? Keep a log of, of what you do during the week, you know, day to day, how maybe you walked half an hour at lunch, keep track of that stuff because it can help build motivation and it can be very rewarding. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get any, first of all, any questions before we continue here? No. Okay. So we'll take a look at the different types of exercise. So we're gonna start with cardiorespiratory training. So I think everybody understands how important cardiorespiratory training is, right, to overall health. It increases exercise capacity. It improves blood pressure and uh, lipid profile. So you think about cholesterol. It decreases brain lesions, so it can reduce the risk of dementia. 
It increases cognitive function and improves mental alertness. Now, we don't have to measure intensity when you do cardiorespiratory training. You can simply just go for a walk and that's perfectly fine. If you're somebody that does like to measure intensity, there's a couple simple ways to do that. You can simply um, measure what's called ratings of perceived exertion. So you can just on a scale of one to 10, one being super easy and 10 being super hard, just rate yourself your, what your current level is at one to 10. So if you're going for a walk, do you feel like you're working somewhat hard? Maybe that's a three or a four out of 10, right? We can also use a percentage of your maximum heart rate. And there's different ways to determine what that is, what your maximum heart rate is. The easiest way is to simply subtract your age from 220. That's your maximum heart rate. And then you would calculate a percentage of that, right? So if we take a look at the guidelines here for cardiorespiratory training, frequency, five to seven days per week. Intensity, if you're measuring intensity, again, you don't have to, but if you are, we're looking for something like very light to somewhat hard. So one to four out of 10. And then if you like, you, you can progress to a five to seven out of 10. If you're using maximum heart rate, percentage of maximum heart rate, typically 50 to 85% of your maximum heart rate. The time, 30 to 60 minutes per day, either continuous or accumulated. So you don't have to do 60 minutes of cardio all at once. You could go for three 20 minute walks, right? You could go for a 20 minute walk in the morning, at lunch and in the evening, and that's 60 minutes of cardio respiratory training that day. And what type of activity? Pick something you enjoy. Quite often people um, pick activities or start doing activities that they don't really enjoy, and then it's super difficult to stick with it, right? So pick something that you can, that is easy for you and something you enjoy. So now let's take a look at strength training. Now you don't have to do strength training, of course, but if you do, this is the sequencing that I recommend. Um, so this would be one workout, and I'll go through what these things are here in a moment, but we begin with mobility training with foam rolling typically foam roll three to five areas, do three to five stretches, one to four core exercises, one to four balance exercises, zero to two reactive activation exercises. And again, I'll explain what these are here in a moment. And then for resistance training, one to two exercises per body part. So with mobility training here. So as I mentioned earlier, as we get older, we begin to lose mobility, right? And we can lose as much as 25% of our joint range of motion as we get older. As we lose range of motion, there's a reduction in the proprioceptive input into the central nervous system. So our joints have these sensory receptors called proprioceptors that send information to the brain, telling the brain how that joint is moving and where it is at all times, okay? So that's really important information for the brain because it helps the brain decide where to send the, the motor control, where to send what muscles to contract and all that, right? So as we get older and we lose range of motion, we lose some of that sensory input. The loss of range of motion also forces us to compensate because we have these stiff joints. And so we have to compensate around those stiff joints and that can result in a reduction in sensory motor control. And it can also result in a phenomenon called relative flexibility. So relative flexibility is when we have stiffness at one joint, that can result in hypermobility and instability at adjacent joints. And quite common, what happens as we get older, our hips become really stiff. And so the adjacent joints, the lumbar spine, for example, have to compensate and they become hypermobile, become unstable, increases wear and tear on the lumbar spine and increases our risk for injury. Okay, so mobility is really important because it enhances our sensory motor control, it improves our movement quality and reduces wear and tear on the body. Two mobility techniques that I'm gonna show you here are foam rolling and stretching. So we'll start with foam rolling. So you may have seen these foam rollers before. So this is a form of self myofascial release. So what the foam roller does is it applies pressure to muscles. And when we apply pressure to muscle, we activate mechanoreceptors that are embedded within that muscle. And when those mechanoreceptors are activated, they initiate a reflex called autogenic inhibition, which causes the muscle to relax. Okay, so by foam rolling a muscle, 
So if the muscles stay tight and tense and we foam roll it, it's going to relax a little bit, right? So that's why we foam roll. We typically just foam roll tight muscles. You can foam roll any muscle, but if we're trying to really improve somebody's quality of movement, we're identifying which muscles are tight and foam rolling those muscles. And the um, protocol is you get on the foam roller, you roll around, you look for a sensitive spot and you stay on that spot for 30 seconds to two minutes, and then you move on to the next muscle, okay? So here's some examples here. She's doing her hip, that's her tensor fascia lata. This is the adductor complex. Calves, and feel free to jump in with any questions at any time, guys. So that's the calves. This guy, this is pretty cool. So this is called the back buddy. And you guys actually may really like this. So you can get this from Amazon and it's a gr great tool to help reach those tight, tense muscles in your neck, right? And so I have, I have one of these. I have a lot of clients who use them as well. Everybody loves it. Again, you can find it at, at Amazon. If you want the link, you can just send me a message. I'll send it to you. This is another tool. I don't really like this one as much. It's kind of like a rolling pin. You just kind of like roll it up and down the muscle. It does work though. I just find it's not as comfortable. He's using the rolling pin there on his hip. So then after foam rolling, we've inhibited the muscles. We've got the muscle to relax a little bit and makes it now easier for us to stretch. So static stretching is a great way to improve the flexibility Hello. of muscle. Yep, yep. Um, give me a moment. You have a question? Well, so static stretching um, is a great way for us to lengthen muscles. So when we have tight muscles, not all tight muscles are short. Sometimes like, there's a difference between mechanical tightness and a neurological tightness, but most tight muscles are short. And so static stretching is a great way to lengthen the muscle and return it back to optimal length. The protocol is you just take that muscle to the first like resistance barrier where you feel that first point of tension, you hold that for 30 seconds to two minutes, and then you can repeat that to the next resistance barrier if you like, or just stop at um, just at that one, one stretch. Quite often, if I have somebody who has a really tight muscle, we'll hold the stretch for 20 seconds, but repeat it like three or four times. And that's a really good way to lengthen a muscle. So here's some examples. She's stretching her adductors. He's stretching his neck there. This is a good stretch for the hip as well as the latissimus dorsi, which is under the, the shoulder. This is a great calf stretch here. All right, so core balance and reactive training. So this is really important. As we get older, we become less coordinated and this, this that can increase our risk for, for injuries and risk for falls even, right? So we use core balance and reactive training to improve our balance and neuromuscular control because if we have better balance and neuromuscular control, then we're, we're less likely to become injured, okay? And we'll start with uh, core training here. Now, a lot of people think the core is the abdominal muscles. And, and, and it, that's true. I mean, the abdominals are part of the core, but the core includes all of the muscles, all of the connective tissue and all of the joints that stabilize the pelvis, the hips and the lumbar spine. The reason we wanna strengthen the core is because having a strong core and having an efficient or coordinated core provides a foundation for movement. So it helps us move better. And if we move better, then there's going to be less wear and tear in our body and we're going to have less risk for injury. It's also a good way to manage chronic pain. Increasing core strength is a good way to manage chronic pain because again, we're reducing wear and tear on the body. Okay. So the protocols here, the guidelines, we pick one to four core exercises. I'll show you some here in a minute. We do one to three sets of each exercise, eight to 12 reps if it's a moving exercise or if it's a static hold, 10 to 60 seconds. Rest interval is zero to 90 seconds and the frequency is two to four days per week. So this here is the bird dog this guy's doing. I do that with everybody, even like professional athletes, this is usually part of their warm up. That's the bird dog there. 
This is a glute bridge with a march. So she pushes her hips up and she tries to keep her hips parallel to the floor as she lifts the one leg. So it's hard because as you lift that right leg, that right hip wants to drop down, right? So you gotta use your core, your glutes to try to keep the pelvis level. This is a front plank. We have a ball crunch here. This one, I actually don't really like this exercise. I shouldn't have put it in, but I, this is like a back extension. The, the reason I don't really like this exercise is quite often the muscles in the low back are already quite tense and overactive. So I typically don't like to isolate them with exercises, um, but there are situations where you can do that. This is a trunk rotation with resistance. You can use a band. And this is the uh, same idea, trunk rotation. She's throwing a ball. This guy's slamming the ball down. It works the, the abdominals. Balance training. All right, so balance training is awesome. And it's a lot of fun. Everybody really likes it. It's really rewarding. It improves postural control and stability, enhances neuromuscular coordination, and is one of the best strategies we have to reduce lower extremity injuries. So like ankle sprains and knee injuries and even hip injuries. And, um, you know, for people who are getting older, it's a really effective intervention for fall prevention as well. So the protocols or the guidelines, one to four exercises, which again, I'll show you here in a moment, one to three sets of each exercise, eight to 20 reps. If it's moving, if it's a static hold, 10 to 60 seconds, rest interval, zero to 90 seconds, frequency is two to four days per week. So this guy here, he's balancing on one leg and he's using the chair for assistance, right? And you can progress and, and not use the chair for help. And you can do this again for 10 seconds and then reset 10 seconds, or you can try to build up to 30 seconds. And once you can do that for 30 seconds with your eyes open, you can then try to close your eyes and see if you can balance with your eyes closed. It's a lot more challenging. She's doing a step up to balance. So she's stepping up and then just balance, holding that top position for a few seconds as she holds, as she tries to balance there. This is a lunge to balance. It's a terrible lunge, very bad technique. <laughs> this is a single leg touchdown. These are pretty challenging. So he's reaching down and across and then standing back up. Great exercise for the lower extremity. Um, a really good balance exercise. Reactive training. So this is a form of plyometrics. It's a, a lower intensity type of plyometric. I don't know if you guys heard of plyometrics before, but the explosive jumping that you know athletes do. Um, this would be a, a regression from those exercises. And I have everybody do these, whether they're an older person that's just trying to um, uh, get in better shape and you know be able to. Uh, play with their grandkids or whether it's a really advanced athlete. What these exercises are is they're basically you're hopping from one foot from the other and you're trying to stick the landing and we can go forwards and backwards, side to side in all different directions. And you're trying to hold the landing for three to five seconds. And the idea here, the theory is that when you have to eccentrically decelerate your body weight against the force of gravity, it forces the neuromuscular system to increase what we call uh, motor unit discharge. So the muscle starts to contract faster and that enhances your, your coordination. It improves what we call reactive stability. So your ability to, like say you slip down the stairs and you can catch yourself, that would be an example of reactive stability. So these exercises improve um, your, your, your nervous system's ability to react to unstable environments. The protocols, you don't have to do this, but I have pretty, everybody do it pretty much. Zero to two exercises, one to three sets of each exercise, six to 12 reps. The rest interval is zero to 90 seconds, two to four days per week. So here she's just jumping from her right foot to her left foot and again, sticking the landing. Another little tidbit here, and I don't think this is in any of the pictures, but if you land with your knee flexed to 30 degrees, so you have 30 degree knee flexion, that enhances the companionship between the quadriceps and the hamstring. So that improves 
knee stability, right? So I do a lot of exercises with my people in that 30 degrees of knee flexion. We get the best cold contraction between the hamstring and the quadricep. So again, side to side jump. He's jumping from his right foot forward, landing onto his left foot, sticking the landing, and then you can jump backwards as well from the left foot landing backwards onto the right foot. And here he's jumping from his right foot, rotating and then landing onto his left foot, and then he would jump back in the same, same way. Okay, so again, those are reactive activation exercises. Resistance training. So this is probably the most motivating types of exercise there is. And the reason for that is because you see improvements pretty quickly. Right. And so if you're somebody that struggles with, with motivation, beginning a resistance training program can be really effective way to, to sort of get attached to exercise and to stick with something because you see results really quickly, usually within the first few weeks. The benefits of resistance training increases cardiovascular efficiency, decreases body fat, increases bone density, increases neuromuscular control increases endurance, strength, and power, and improves cognitive function and mood. The protocol, one to two exercises per body part. There's different ways to do resistance training. You don't have to do body parts. We quite often now, instead of thinking about body parts, we think about movements. So we'd be like a push, a pull, a squat, those sorts of things. So we do four to 10 exercises in total, one to three sets of each exercise six to 20 reps, the rep range and the, and the sets and all that depends what your goal is. The rest interval, zero to three minutes, frequency two to four days per week. So this is a chest press here. Here's, that's the chest press. You can do the chest press on the stability ball. This, this makes the exercise less of a strength movement and more of a stability movement. So a different kind of adaptation we're targeting with that. Both are really effective and depending on what the person's goal is or what kind of phase of training we're in. I'll use both. Okay. This is a shoulder press. Not everybody can shoulder press. So if you have neck issues, if you have shoulder issues, shoulder pressing isn't for everybody. There's different exercise that we can do instead of a shoulder press. Here we have a squat using the ball. Here's doing a squat into a shoulder press. Again, not everybody, not shoulder pressing isn't good for everybody and a step up to again, shoulder press. Now, for anybody listening, if you have any chronic health conditions, right? So we're talking about say hypertension or, or diabetes, maybe you've had heart, heart failure or stroke in the past, and you're looking for some guidance at the American College of Sports Medicine, we have some very specific and very thorough exercise prescriptions for each health condition, right? So it doesn't matter what your chronic health condition is. We have a prescription to treat that condition. It will get you feeling better probably than you felt in a really long time. So here's some examples. This would be for hypertension, high blood pressure. And this is all, obviously a ton of research has gone into this. <clears throat> if you have any of these chronic health conditions or any chronic health condition, you can send me an email. I'll send you the protocol and you can take that and discuss it with your doctor. Here's what we do after somebody's had heart failure. So we like a stroke. It'd be like a, um, like a clot in the lower extremity. COPD, that's pretty, that's really common. Diabetes, also very common. Kidney disease. And we have a, a bunch of others. So if you have any issues at all, any chronic health conditions, and you're looking for some help with that, just send me an email and I'll send the prescription. I'll also, I can discuss it with you as well. I'm not going to charge you guys for any of that stuff. So that's all I have planned. If you guys have any questions, anything you guys want to talk about, anything I didn't cover or anything you want me to go further into?